Okay, this is 8.4, conditional proof, CP. So we're going to talk a little bit about the steps to do CP. Then we're going to do a really easy CP problem. Then we'll do a harder CP problem. And CP is just like RAA that it seems way more complicated than it is. If you stay focused on the, the three steps, you finish a step, move on to the next step, it's really, really not that complicated. So let's talk about the steps first. So step one for CP, assume the left. That's an abbreviation for assume the left side of the conditional that you're trying to form. So the great thing about CP is that it lets you make up or lets you form arrow statements. It lets you form conditional statements. So let's say I, I want to form this conditional statement. It could be my conclusion or it could just be any arrow that I'm trying to form. It doesn't just have to be the conclusion. But this is the arrow that I want to make. So I assume the left side of the arrow that I'm trying to form. I assume the left. So for step one, I would assume A. Right? The next step, step two, is get the right, which is abbreviation for get the right side of the arrow that you're trying to form. So you assume A in step one, and you try to get the right side of the arrow in step two. So we start with A, we assume A, and our goal is to get to B. Once we get B, we finish step two, but not before then. And then finally, the third step is reform the arrow. So you assume A, you get B, and then after you do that, you can reform the arrow like that, right? You get to remake the arrow, and you'll have a number, some number, let's say like, I don't know, question mark, question mark, CP. And we'll talk about what, what numbers go right there in just a second, but that's essentially... That's essentially what CP looks like. Assume the left side of the arrow, get the right side of the arrow, you're done. Reform the arrow. So again, that is easier shown than said. So just keep those in your mind. Keep those three steps in your mind as we move forward and actually do these proofs. So the first proof we're going to do is really pretty straightforward. All right, we have our premises and our conclusion. So I'm looking at this conclusion and these premises and I'm thinking, okay, how do I know that I'm going to use CP? Well, there's a really good clue. Anytime you have a conditional conclusion, right, the arrow is the main connector of the conclusion, you can use CP because that's going to let you form the arrow. So if I see this, I'm automatically thinking I'm going to use CP right off the bat. So I know that that means I'm going to have to start with step one, assume the left side. So I'm going to assume, and every time we make an assumption, right, we have that line out to the side. I assume the left side, so that means assume Z. This line out to the left means basically that I am making things up, right? I, I, I've made up Z. And I have to operate with that line out to the left until I can finish step two. So now that I've got Z, I can do a couple of things. I can look there on line one. I can do, hopefully by now you see that I can do modus ponens, right? If you can't, you really need to go back to 8.1. Check that out. So that's line 1 and 3 MP. What else can I do? What else can I do? Okay, well, there's a match in line 2 and 3. I can get tilde Y. Oops, sorry. I can get tilde Y from lines 2 and 3. Okay, let's see, what else can I get a match for? Oh, right there, look at that. Just a whole bunch of MP. Right there with 4 and 5. Right, I have the left side of line 4 right there on line 5. That lets me get X from 4 and 5 MP. Right? And the whole time I'm doing this, right, I started with step 1, assume the left side, and I just kept working and working and working because my goal is to get X. So the whole time I'm doing this, I'm seeing rules and I'm applying rules, but with the goal in mind to get to X, because that's what step two says, get the right side. So now I actually have the right side right here, and that means I can stop. So I move on to step three, which is reform the arrow. So whenever you get the right side, you are out of your assumption, so you no longer make the line to the left, and you reform the arrow. So it's as easy as just rewriting the conclusion, or whatever arrow you're trying to form. So 
right? We assume the left side, we got the right side, step one, step two, step three. And the way we note this is with a three dash six, right? Everything where the line was. The line was three through six. So it's not a comma, it's actually a dash, saying that the assumption took place through three through six. CP. That's all there is to it. So as long as you stay focused on each of those three steps, it's really very simple. But the hard part is when you try to get mixed up or, or get things out of order. So just stay focused on those three steps and you should be fine. The only thing that we can do to make CP harder is to make getting from assuming the left side to getting the right side more complicated. And that's what this problem is basically going to do. Same exact process, just a, a longer proof, basically. <coughs> so, again... Looking at the conclusion, the main connector is an arrow, so I'm automatically thinking CP. So I look at my arrow and I see this is slightly different. So some people get freaked out and they say, oh no, it's right, this is longer, this left side is bigger, but it doesn't matter. You still follow step one, assume the left side. So this is the left side, so that's exactly what we assume. G dot tilde L. Right? Now that we have that to work with, right? so we've completed step one. We have assumed the left side. So now our goal is to get the right side. Our goal is to get K. If we can get K, we can finish this proof. So now it just becomes a regular proof. But instead of trying to get the conclusion, we're just trying to get the right side, as according to step two. So right? I see I have a conjunction in line five. All right? So anytime I have a conjunction, I always try to break it apart. Five, simp. All right. Again, breaking bo both parts apart. You never know what you're going to be able to use. So now I have to look, okay? Remember there's no don't make this more complicated than it needs to be, right? There's no restriction. There's no you can't use things that are inside the line or outside the line. There's none of that. All this line is is just basically a note. It doesn't affect how you do the proof. So, what can I do? Oh, well there's a match, right? For MP so I can get E wedge L from lines 4 and 6 MP. All right, well, what can I do now? Hmm. Oh, look at there. DS match, right? I can get E from line 7 and 8 DS. Right? Again, if you're not being able to follow along with this, you need to go back to 8.1. This should be really, this part should be really easy. Okay, now that I've got E, remember, whenever you're doing a proof, don't forget to look back at the top of the proof and see some maybe premises you haven't used before. That's very important. So I can get Z from 2 and 9 MP. Eleven. Okay. Hmm, what can I do now? Well, I haven't used lines one or two. Maybe I should think about that. Well, I've got an almost match at line three. Maybe if I use one of my equivalency rules, right, I could use MP on line three, but I'm, I, I'm not quite there yet. You could go at this two ways. You could say do contraposition like I'm about to do, or you could use double negation and do modus tollens. Either way is acceptable. I think contraposition is a little bit easier to understand, so I use that. So I flip around line three. Line three, contraposition. And so I'm really close to being able to use modus ponens on that line, but I have to use double negation to turn not not z into z. Remember, you can only use double negation on one one uh, one section at a time. You can't do double negation maybe like both sides. Don't try to combine steps. So that's just 11 dn. And now I can get I can get tilde tilde p by itself with lines 10 and 12. And that's just mp, right? Hmm. 14 so now I can turn tilde tilde p into p through 13 dn. All this is an effort though. Remember, you got to stay focused. Got to stay focused on step two. Even though I've done 
all these things, I got to stay focused on steps two, which is to get the right side, get the right side. So I see that there's a K there. And if I can get the left side of line one, I could use modus ponens. So all of this has been an effort to try to get K. And now I finally am able to form the left side of line one by combining line six, where I have G, and line 14, where I have P. So that's six and 14 conj, right? And that lets me use modus ponens to get out of line one, finally, on line 16, K. And that's just through one and 15 M. Now that was a really long way to go about getting the right side. There was a really long way to go about getting complete with step two, but that's essentially all it is, is you start by assuming the left and you work the proof until you can get the right. When you get the right, you're done with step two, you stop with the assumption line to the left and you reform the arrow according to step three. So step three says reform the arrow. So the arrow is that we're trying to form, right? We have G, uh, G dot tilde L, close parentheses, arrow K. And we note that by saying everything that was in the assumption line, which was 5 through 16 CP. Right? Very, very straightforward if you can stay focused on the three steps. Assume the left side, right? the left side of the arrow that you're trying to form. Go get the right side of the arrow that you're trying to form. And finally, step three, reform the arrow. Right? That's all there is to it. Do a bunch of these because once you do them, you really get in the rhythm and you can get good. This is 8.4, so go to 8.4a, knock a couple of them out, um, and you'll be in a much better place. So, as always, email me if you have questions. Thanks and gig them.